replicate. And it, it, before evolution got started, there weren't any fancy complicated enzymes. So there has to be some simple chemical process that can copy the information in uh, a strand of something. Could be RNA, could be something like RNA. There's still a lot of uncertainty about what the first genetic polymers were. It could have been something really different that got taken over by RNA later on. Uh, these replicated molecules then have to get distributed to the daughter cells. And if both of those replication processes can go on, we have a cycle that can continue indefinitely. And in going through that kind of cycle, because replication is not particularly accurate uh, in such a system, you would explore a lot of sequence space. Uh, there might have been a large number of initial sequences. Somewhere along the line, a sequence that actually could do something useful and enhance the replication or the survival of these primitive cells, somewhere a useful sequence would come along, would provide an advantage, and it would gradually increase in abundance in the population. And that's the beginning of Darwinian evolution. The change in the genetic structure of a population is Darwinian evolution. And that's what we'd like to see happen spontaneously in the laboratory. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start off by talking about uh, those uh, cell membranes, primitive cell membranes. We can't make them out of the same kinds of molecules that our membranes are made of because uh, uh, they don't have any, almost any of the right properties. Uh, but it turns out that very simple molecules, fatty acids and close relatives, uh, spontaneously form membranes, and they have very interesting uh, properties uh, that I want to illustrate with a short movie that was made by uh, Janet Iwasa when she was in my lab. So this is just an animation uh, to show you the dynamics of these structures. There's a lot of motion. Hmm, it's not actually displaying that well, but anyway, you can see molecules are flipping from one side to the other, they're coming in from the environment, they're leaving the membrane. Uh, uh, these membranes are also very permeable to polar, even charged molecules. So, so uh, molecules that couldn't get across our membranes without the help of complicated proteins can easily get across membranes like this um, spontaneously. Um, and it's kind of nice that membranes with just the right properties are what you get from simpler building blocks that might have been around on the early Earth. Okay, so what do these molecules look like? Uh, uh, one that we use a lot in our lab sort of model experiments is just oleic acid, the fatty acid that you would get out of uh, hydrolysis of olive oil. Uh, there's a shorter chain one, meristoleic acid, that has very nice properties. When we want to do something that is really a model of uh, something more plausible prebiotically, we use a shorter chain uh, saturated fatty acid, capric acid. All of these things, if you mix them up in water with some, some salt at the right pH, they spontaneously assemble into really beautiful uh, structures, uh, vesicles and vesicles within vesicles. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so they self-assemble easily. They can trap nucleic acid spontaneously. How can they grow and divide? That was the real question. And the first steps in looking at that were made uh, by Pierluigi Luisi, uh, who showed that if you pre-assemble vesicles and feed them additional fatty acids uh, as free molecules or in the form of micelles, these incoming molecules can get inserted into the membrane, and the membrane can grow. So growth is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, we started to study that process and look at it mechanistically, which turned out to be pretty interesting. Uh, we used fluorescent dyes uh, so that we could study the process in real time. So if you have donor and acceptor fluorescent uh, dyes, as the membrane grows, the dyes on average are further apart. Uh, energy transfer between them gets less efficient, and you can use that uh, kind of process to follow uh, to follow growth in real time. And uh, Marty Hanchik and Shelly Fujikawa in my lab showed that uh, feeding preformed vesicles with new fatty acids could be really efficient. You could incorporate around 90% of the, of the food molecules uh, in, into the original set of vesicles. 
Okay, so, so growth uh, is it's actually mechanistically pretty complicated and interesting, but uh, operationally it's very simple. What about division? Okay, so it turns out in our early experiments, again, work done by Marty and Shelley, uh, we used a very uh, sort of crude, artificial way of forcing division to happen. Basically, you take big vesicles, force them through small pores in a membrane, small vesicles come out the other side. Um, so we don't think that anything like that could actually happen in nature, right? This is just a lab trick to make things work. But it's a nice proof of principle. It shows that with physical forces alone, you can take a protocell membrane that's grown and divide it into daughter cells. And the important thing is you actually don't lose uh, most of the contents. There's some stuff that leaks out, but it's not like the vesicles get shredded and then just reform. So you can actually make a cycle out of this. You can grow and divide and grow and divide uh, as many times as you want. Uh, so, so that was where we were about six or seven years ago. We had a kind of artificial way of doing a cycle of protocell uh, growth and division. Uh, but of course, we wanted something that was that was more robust, where you wouldn't lose any of the contents, something that was more plausible in a natural scenario. And uh, I also always wanted to just be able to watch this happen under the microscope. And, and here we're using very small vesicles, again, made in a kind of artificial way. Uh, so this was really just a model system. Then a couple of years ago, I had a really uh, brilliant uh, MD-PhD student join the lab. Uh, by the name of Ting Zhu. And, 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 and Ting just sort of took on those problems and uh, just sort of solved them all one after another. It was really amazing. First thing he did was to work out a way of making more or less uniform larger vesicles that we could look at in the microscope. He used some simple methods. I told him they would never work. He went and did them anyway. They worked fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best kind of student. Uh, so here what you're looking at is a fluorescent dye trapped in the uh, inside of these uh, uh, vesicles, which are about four microns across. And so what you can do, what Ting did, is just take vesicles like this, dump in some food, more fatty acids, and, and just sit at the microscope and watch and see how they grow. Okay? And we might need the lights down a little bit to see this. Uh, but after about five minutes, this is what he saw. All these vesicles have these little tails growing out of them. Uh, this is not what we expected to happen. We thought, you know, when they grow, they should just sort of, you know, get bigger, right? So we thought, well, <laughs> what's going on here? So this after about five minutes, after about half an hour, all of those spherical starting vesicles have been transformed into these long, uh, hollow, filamentous structures. So none of the contents have leaked out. But the spheres have grown uh, by the addition. They've increased in surface area about uh, threefold uh, during this process. And uh, let me just show you a, a, a movie, a, a, a time lapse of that process, because it's pretty uh, cool. So we'll definitely need the lights down for this. Uh, and then we, can, then we can get them back up. OK. So. All right, so what you see very early on is a faint, thin filament coming out of the parental vesicle. And over a period of about half an hour, it gets uh, brighter, uh, thicker, and longer. And uh, OK, so all right, we can have the lights back up. So that's how it actually happens. And so there, there are two. Uh, issues. Uh, so, so the nice thing is that this leads to a very, very easy way of doing a cycle of growth and division. Okay? And you can see that here. So you start with spherical vesicles, grow them into a filament. Turns out those filaments are really fragile. So all you have to do is shake them gently. You can think about you know, wind blowing on a pond, making little waves, shaking things up. They divide into smaller Vesicles, each filament gives you a whole bunch of smaller vesicles. You can grow them. Um, you can feed them again. And if you don't shake them, they'll just 
grow into bigger spheres, which you can then grow into filaments and divide, and 